Hello students. So today we are still in chapter 7 looking at market inefficiencies. We talked about negative externalities last time. Now we'll talk about positive externalities. So one example we had earlier was education. They produce, it produces benefits to society, not just to students, and those benefits of things like um, stronger democracy and socialization, making kids into adults, have are benefits that have no market, so it's an externality. Now, so as is our supply curve for education down here, the internal is your demand for education. Your demand, though, is based only on your own costs and your own benefits. Recall we said earlier that if a good has positive externalities, the market on its own tends to provide too little of it. We had that back over, over here. So if vaccines, for example, you think about what are my costs of getting a vaccine and what are my benefits, what you don't think about is how you getting vaccinated helps out the rest of society because now you're not going to spread the disease. Likewise with education, you think about what are my benefits for getting educated and what are my costs. What you don't think about is how does your education help out society overall. So you're underestimating the true benefits. Now if you were to fully account for those extra benefits to society, then your demand curve would be out here, de-social. Now in the market outcome, you care only about your own benefits, your own costs. That demand curve intersects supply over here. You consume this quantity, Q market. You'd pay this price, P market. Now if you were to fully account for all those extra benefits to society, your demand curve would be up here, and that crosses over supply at this point. You have price P star B efficient, and quantity Q star B efficient. So as expected, markets underprovide goods that have positive externalities. That is, Q market is below Q star when you have positive externalities, just like we said, just like we said a couple of slides ago. So here the market is inefficient. That creates deadweight loss. So think about the, this area over here between Q market and Q star. The supply curve is telling us the marginal cost of providing that extra education. That's down here. Society's benefits from that education is up on D social. That's over here. Society's benefits, including your own benefits, that is. So if society values education at, say, 15000 up here, and it costs society 13000 to provide the education, then it would be a good thing if the education were to happen. The benefits of 15000 exceed the costs. However, because you're focused on your own benefits, and not society's benefits, from your standpoint, the costs look too high, so you don't do it. That's how the market would be inefficient if there weren't some kind of policy to fix things. Now, one point I made earlier, it's not necessarily true that goods with positive externalities should always be free. In my diagram here, the efficient price here was not zero. And the efficient quantity was not way out here where the price would be free. So free college is not necessarily efficient. So also is free high school and free elementary school and free middle school, which we have in the U.S. That might not be efficient. You've got to do some math to figure out, are those social benefits really worth the cost? Is free education actually efficient or is that providing too much?
you can have too much of a positive externality. I'm not really familiar with the education economic literature, so maybe it is justified to have free college or free high school, but you can't just assume it's true based solely on this analysis. you got to do some math to find out if that is the best policy. What we can say for sure, though, is that the market is going to be inefficient with education. If you just let the market go on its own with no intervention, there is not going to be enough education. So we said that one way to deal with externalities was with the Coase theorem. So we had, if you have um, low bargaining costs and you have property rights, then people can negotiate, and those negotiations will result in efficiency. The problem, though, is that sometimes bargaining costs aren't low. We talked about with pollution in the ocean, it affects so many people, you can't get them all together to bargain over pollution. Likewise, with education, that affects all of society. You can't get all of America together in one room to talk about what's the right approach to education. That means you can't use Coase theorem because bargaining costs are too high. So what can we do instead? We can subsidize education. That's what we do here. So let's say that society benefits by $1,000 from your education. What the government could then do is give you a $1,000 subsidy. That would shift your demand curve, your de-internal, up by $1,000. That would cause it to line up with society's demand. That would make you internalize the externality like we saw earlier. It's because when you're thinking about that $1,000 subsidy, it's going to be the same as if you had thought about society's $1,000 benefit. So your accounting for the subsidy is like accounting for society's benefits. So now your decision making is going to be efficient. That will cause us to get to the efficient outcome and fix the problem in the market. So there's a justification for using subsidies in the case of education. We saw early in Chapter 5 that in other markets, subsidies can be a bad idea, but here, subsidies actually improve upon the market outcome. Now, is the subsidy high enough or should it be higher? You gotta do some math to figure that out. So that wraps up our section on externalities. Be sure to tune in for our next episode in which we'll talk about public goods.